I just no, I just found out about the place yesterday. <laughs> okay. And I put it in there and then it said pick it up at like three fifty or yeah. something. So I probably was on lunch. I didn't really know what it was like. If it was you know, yeah. I didn't so yeah, and I know you see me? Yeah, you know, I would have came down I can see you. Can you hear us? No, well here's what happened was is I was can you hear me? And um I looked in the inventory and see there was uh, no two XLs and can you hear me? I, I don't even have one yet of my own, so yeah. I was like, oh, maybe there's an inventory issue, because when I was looking there, I found it to that cell. Oh. So, okay, that's weird, but your order hadn't come to me. Oh, okay, no, no, I just, so I took it home with me last night, uh, and that's why I was at the house and not here, yeah. and ready when you got here. No, I, uh, like the act. Jared, can you see me? Can you do the bathroom? Huh? Can you do the bathroom? I need to. Okay, good. Yeah. I just No, just me. Hello. Hey. There she is. Yes, I had to click out. Can you hear, can you hear me? Oh. Oh yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. She can hear us. Oh. We can't hear her. I can hear you. Okay. Now you're muted. Now you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? No. Hmm. Hmm. That's odd. Uh, let's see. The other person in the session can see and hear me. Talk now. How about now? There it is. All right. Our speaker is wrong. Okay. All right. Well, we've got uh, five minutes to wait, so... All right. Yeah. I've had a rough morning. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I had a, a my cat was uh, sick and oh, no. um, he passed away about oh. an hour ago at home. So. I'm sorry. Yeah. And my mom was with him. So I'm a little, little puffy. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Have you ever heard me talk about Cash? My cat Cash? Oh, yeah. That was him. Aww. Yeah. Thank you, Valencia. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm a little, a little puffy. Oh, and Jared, we do have plenty of food here. We had the, um, we were a satellite site, so I ordered food. All right. Um, so, after the session, if you guys want to come down, I have Giovanni's sandwiches, chips, salad. Right. Yep. yep. I will be leaving right after your session is done, after I do the closing remarks um, to go. Amber's bringing the cat up. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. How's things been going so far? Pretty good. Yeah, there. A lot of the sessions have had, you know, quite a few people in them. Uh huh. Um, they had a really good session this morning. It was a panel discussion um, about accessing capital, especially businesses in the Appalachia area, and mm -hmm. what the different programs can offer. So yeah, and it probably had about thirty or forty people in it. Oh, wow. So yeah. Did you get our slideshow? Let me check. I got your bio. Uh, um, let's see. No, I did not get the slideshow. But um, whenever you go to share, there's a little little thing down at the bottom. It's got like a uh, it's like a monitor. And it's got a line through it. Yeah. You'll click that. Okay. And that should allow you to share your screen. Okay. Yeah. Let me. So we've we're down to two minutes. I'm gonna. We've got three people in the session so far. I really want more. <laughs> um, I will tell you, you're up against grant writing for entrepreneurs. 
Yeah, I saw that. I don't know that that's going to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would probably be on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but marketing's so important. I know. Yes. It's okay, though. Yes. We got a pretty sideshow. It'll be nice. Oh, good deal. Good deal. <laughs> um, now, are you concentrating a lot more on just marketing and visual, or are you trying to sell some website design? Uh, a little bit of everything. So it starts off with our story, our market, and then I got a little bit of a brief like evolution of marketing, how it started, where it's going. Mm -hmm. And then we do some real deep diving into social media okay. and the algorithms, um, what each uh, social, social media platform offers. We kind of okay. break those out. And then we talk about overall the importance of branding and consistency and all that good stuff. All that good stuff. All right. Um, whenever you start talking, I will, I will put my camera, take my camera off so everybody can concentrate on you. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. T minus one minute. Fix, one minute. fix the hair. Fix the hair. <laughs> <laughs> So there's one person in there. I don't know how to sit still, so this should be interesting. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to um, the fourth annual We Mean Business virtual conference. Um, today is day three. Um, we have been working pretty hard to get this conference put together. Um, and I was on that committee helping with that. And one of the ideas that I had as a presentation was marketing, because marketing is the be all and end all of a lot of businesses. Um, working in the nonprofit world, I have seen the need for marketing and um, the psychology of it, um, getting your message across, because that is what we do every day. We walk out of the house and we are constantly bombarded with messages. So it's how you convey those messages to get your product and your service out there. Marketing is such an integral piece of that. So we are very happy to have uh, Jared Depew and Israelia. I don't know your last name. Kali. Kali. Um, here from Metropolis Design Studios. They are based in um, Chillicothe, Ohio. Ooh. And I'm going to go over a little bit. Brief bio, uh, Jared is a Chillicothe native, uh, father of three who has always loved art. Um, with a background in illustration, Jared found a passion for graphic design and marketing psychology in high school. And before starting Metropolis Design Studios, he held the title of PR Marketing Director of Goodwill of South Central Ohio. And that's where I saw most of his work um, was through that. Uh, finding the love for the nonprofit world, he solved the gap locally for quality marketing and design services. And with his business partner, Chad McAllister, he started Metropolis in 2016. And oh, how far have you come, my friend? Um, <laughs> as a simple web graphic design studio, but over the past five years, the short five years, it has evolved into a full service marketing agency. And he is provided, they are providing design and marketing services for many of Southern Ohio's businesses. In addition to Metropolis, Jared is also co-owner of Midway Sign Company, Star City Press, and Mill City Apparel. And he said he hates writing these bios. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to welcome Jared and Israelia. You did not send me your bio. So, oh. all right, all right. <laughs> but I do know that you're the social media guru behind Metropolis. So Welcome, both of you guys. I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. So let me click this little guy. And we're going to share. It's coming. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. You Not see us? All right. Yep. Let me bring up our slideshow here. All right. We see that okay? Yeah, it looks great. All right. Um, so we put together a little presentation uh, for today's session on uh, marketing. So what we're going to try to do here is, uh, as 
briefly and concisely as we can kind of break down some, uh, you know, the evolution of marketing, uh, how we got here, where we're heading. Um, and a lot of things that we specialize with, with a lot of our clients in Southern Ohio uh, is digital and social media marketing. So we're really going to break down the different social media platforms, uh, kind of give some tips and hints on how to figure out which platform is best for you and uh, how you can uh, really reach an audience on those platforms. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into uh, the slideshow here. Uh, like you said, we are Metropolis Design Studios. Um, we are really big on relationships. Uh, a lot of our business and a lot of our clients we see as partnerships. That's how we've always approached uh, the how we do things. So it's important to us to have those face-to-face, -face, those uh, you know, over-the-phone relationships with our clients, uh, so we can really understand the things that they need. Uh, we adopted this uh, this new uh, tagline or, or mission, if you will, in the last year. So we're a design studio built on relationship and a focus on excellence. Uh, this is just a little bit of who we are. So my name is Jared. I'm a creative director and co-founder of Metropolis Design Studios. Uh, I've been, uh, like she said in the bio, uh, an art geek for most of my life. Uh, I really thought I was going to be a pencil artist. Uh, but when I was in high school, I took a class called Commercial Arts, which introduced me to the concept of marketing psychology and graphic design, and really just kind of fell in love with the idea of, uh, of going into marketing and uh, using my uh, abilities and talents to kind of, you know, shape different businesses and, and promotional things like that. Um, definitely didn't turn out to be a Ninja Turtle like I had planned as a child. Uh, but this is uh, actually not too bad. <laughs> and then my cohort for today's presentation is Israela. She is our communications coordinator and our social media expert. Um, I am. <laughs> uh, I'm 24 years old, so I was uh, born and raised by the Internet. Um, and that's kind of my my claim to my qualifications. Um, <clears throat> I have. Uh, a passion and a love for uh, small business. Um, I've worked for mostly small businesses throughout my career. Um, and I am Southern Ohio born and bred as well. So uh, I have a really great connection to uh, the heart of the people in Southern Ohio. And I think that's kind of what sets us apart is that we do have this focus and commitment to uh, this area that we get to call home. Um, and I'm excited to be here today. So. All right. Uh, like I stated, we're proudly located in Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, this has been a really uh, exciting time for Chillicothe. A lot of uh, revitalization. Uh, we had a little bit of a halt during COVID, but really, you have, it's a strong community. Everybody kind of banded together, and we got through the hardest part of that. And we're still seeing a lot of growth in our downtown, in our area here. Um, it's really a, a huge success story and testament to this community, how far they've come uh, through all the trying times, for sure. Uh, and then most recently, named by Ohio Magazine, uh, one of the best hometowns of 2022. So that's actually a really nice claim to fame, and uh, we, we consider that pretty important. Uh, a lot of challenges that we've faced uh, in this area, especially starting out first, so there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, so like I said, I, I really fell in love with the, the concept of marketing and graphic design. But honestly, in this area in Southern Ohio, not a lot of design firms, not a lot of design agencies, uh, not a lot of people looking to hire graphic designers. Uh, so there was really a lack of offerings of good design jobs and things like that. Uh, so we decided, uh, my business partner and I, Chad, that if there wasn't any opportunities, that maybe we could create those. Uh, another thing that we deal with on a, a regular basis, and I know this seems kind of funny, and, and maybe, you know, if you're you're not from Southern Ohio, maybe it's this way everywhere, but in our experience, you know, a general lack of trust, and that's, you know, for big business, for different things like that, uh, trying to relay your message and being able to do that sincerely and have people pick up on that. So that's that was kind of a challenge, because when you try to start something new, or, you know, generally, if you become successful in something, you know, people tend to think negatively. Uh, so, you know, we had a little bit of uh, a little bit of trust to build with a lot of people in Southern Ohio. 
Uh, it also wasn't a lot of understanding. So people knowing that it's important to have good marketing, good design, uh, the message that it sends when you don't have professional looking marketing, um, how to attract people. Uh, you know, people would be like, you know, why, why would I pay you to make a logo when my nephew can make logos? You know what I mean? <laughs> So there just wasn't a lot of understanding of the importance of that. And I do feel that with the revitalization, the resurgence here in Chilcompe, uh, a lot of the younger business owners are really starting to see that. And I think that's been a big uh, part of why we've been successful. And that kind of goes right into uh, an issue of people not seeing the value. Uh, marketing, uh, anybody that's in sales, anybody that's trying to deliver a message, marketing is the key factor to that. But, you know, people tend to not see everything that's involved with that. So there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes, a lot of marketing. You don't even know this marketing. That's, you know, really good marketing. Uh, and, and you're not seeing the value of why you would pay for those sort of things. Word of mouth is fantastic. Referrals are great. Um, but there is a, a point in any business that you just got to market yourself. And it's, there's, you know, if you're a nonprofit, you're really going to get your story out there. So getting people to see the value of what we do and paying for that, that was, that was a little challenging at first. Anything that? You can stop me anytime. No, I think you covered it all. Uh, so how we started back in 2016 was pretty easy. I mean, it was just graphic design and web design. That's all we were going to do. We were going to do flyers. We were going to make logos. And we were going to do web design. But as we started working with our clients, they would ask things like, you know, what about, you know, branding? What about this form of marketing? How can I do this on social media? And as we went along for the last five years, we've really expanded the offerings that we have. Um, a lot of what we do is creative consulting. So people will come to us and say, hey, you know, I want to sell this product, but I need, you know, the packaging, the, you know, the placement, what, what, what demographics, uh, you know, coming up with marketing strategies, digital campaigns. Uh, we went from making logos to true branding, uh, where a logo would be more of a graphical representation of your business. Uh, branding is really the personality and the messaging, how you're perceived, how you come across. Uh, we really started digging really deep into those type of things. Uh, we uh, ended up making signs and we're currently starting to do printing and apparel so it became a, kind of a one-stop shop. I mean, you come to us, we come up with your logo, come up with your brand, and then we can get you anything with your logo on it. We can help you create those campaigns. We can help you spread your message. So it really evolved into a full service agency and it continues to grow and we continue to adapt. I think that something that really fueled that um, was actually the pandemic. Um, although it was scary for everybody, um, it kind of forced this pivot, right, of people being like, okay, I can no longer rely, especially for those like small brick and mortar storefronts, they can no longer rely on having a personality just themselves in the store and that being the driving focus of their marketing. They had to find a way to get their information to the people. And that is when the social media side of things and more, we started having to get more into print because people all of a sudden started to see this need to be able to reach their customers in a new way. And it's really pushed us forward and pushed our limits as well. And one of the best things that Jared always says is we don't know what we can't do until we do it. So that's really been, um, I think, what set us on track to expand so much is that just idea of we're going to do anything we can to help our clients be as successful as possible until we're not capable of helping them anymore. And <laughs> it's turned out really well. So like we said, we really saw a need here in Southern Ohio, and we really wanted to be the folks to kind of bridge that gap for people. We want to be approachable. We wanted to be the place where, you know, you could come ask dumb questions and not get laughed at. To come and, you know, if, if you had some kind of crazy idea and you didn't know how to get it out, we really wanted to be the people you'd come to to kind of do that. So bridging that gap in Southern Ohio uh, like I said, it's taken us about five years. Things continue to grow, but I think we're doing a great job. Uh, in order to facilitate that, oh, sorry, I'm a little ahead of myself there, but this is just some examples of some of our work. 
Uh, we do a lot of branding, a lot of logos, a lot of websites. Uh, anybody from Southern Ohio familiar with Tecumseh, we've done all their marketing and all their design work for the last five years. They were actually our first really big client, and that's something we're super proud of to be involved in. Um, but as you can see, anything from business cards to brochures to packaging, um, if you really take the time to think about it, graphic design and design is everywhere and everything that you do um, and how that translates from your messaging to your client. That's what that's what the gap is. That's what we do is, you know, you have that idea. You want to sell these products. You want to have this personality. We help you tailor that and get it out to the masses. Um, this is a slide I thought was next uh, to bridge the gap. So we ended up uh, it, it seems kind of silly, but it all makes sense. Uh, so from our Metropolis Design Studios, uh, we ended up purchasing a sign company, which we named Midway Sign Company. Uh, it was just a natural fit. There was a gentleman we worked with. He was retiring. Uh, he sold us the business. We were already designing signs. Now we had the ability to make them. Uh, the nice thing about that is we can take a concept and be completely original with it and kind of go outside the box and be able to design that stuff in-house, produce in-house, install. And we have a little bit of quality control of that product, which we really like. Uh, another uh, evolution of things was Star City Press. So we uh, got involved in help doing uh, some marketing for a couple local magazines, which really kind of got us involved in the you know print process and the publication side of things. Uh, so now we can you know source content. We have photographers, we have writers, and produce specialty magazines. Uh, I don't know if you can still see our camera, but this is one of our. Uh, we've done this recently here for uh, the local chamber of commerce. So as you can see, it's a it's a full scale magazine. Um, so that kind of gives us the ability to offer like things like sports programs, school programs, uh, especially publications at any time. And then just recently, within the last month, we launched Mill City Apparel. So we were already kind of silk screening and embroidering shirts for businesses. Uh, but we ended up coming up with our own brand, which, uh, as you can see, again, our love for Chillicothe, we're a paper city, the mill's huge, the smokestack's a big symbol for us. So Mill City was a, a logical fit. So, you know, we make uh, locally, uh, local pride t-shirts, accessories, and then in addition to that, we can embroider hats and t-shirts and, and polos and brand pretty much anything. Um, so we're kind of getting into uh, the presentation here. So that's a, a lot about us. I know it's a little bit probably more than you needed to know, but we really wanted to kind of let you understand where we were coming from. Uh, we by no means feel that we're the absolute experts in all these things. So this presentation is a lot of what we've kind of trial and error and what we've figured out uh, and things that we feel work really well for Southern Ohio. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of people biting for people's attention. There's a lot of noise out there, a lot of marketing, digital, print. It's on the airwaves. It's on your phones. So our job, hopefully today in this short time, is to kind of give you some tips to kind of navigate that and figure out your best approach uh, and how you can uh, use marketing and adapt with it as it's changed over the last couple of years. Um, and to understand where we're heading with this, I always feel like it's always important to kind of look back and see how things, you know, kind of begun. I mean, from, from cave paintings all the way up to smartphones, I mean, as, as a, a race of people, humans, I mean, we've always been able to communicate, you know, it's, you know, word of mouth, it's through pictures and, in true human fashion, you know, how do we monetize that? So... <laughs> You know, the evolution of marketing is actually a pretty interesting uh, thing to look into. So this is really kind of a broad scope. So this is, marketing has been around forever. I mean, anybody on this call, as long as we've been alive, marketing's been a part of our lives. And it's impacted things from, you know, blue is for boys, pink is for girls. That was all marketing. That wasn't something that was decided at birth. A marketing company decided, all right, pink products are for girls. This is what they're for. Uh, so a lot of things that you take for granted on a regular basis and the way you feel about one thing or another could absolutely be the result of a marketing campaign of some kind. So it's uh, both amazing and terrifying all at the same time. So in the beginning, uh, marketing was completely one-sided at first. So it was really just 
whoever was selling the product, whoever was doing the service was telling the people, this is what we have to offer. So it would be, you know, a, a flyer on a wall, you know, wanted posters and taverns, you know, all the things that would be in common areas where people would gather, there would be visuals or, you know, you would speak to a group of people. Um, but it was always one sided. There wasn't a lot of input from the consumer side. It was usually whoever had the product was doing all the talking. So, you know, there was no real effective way for consumers to share any thoughts or even ask any questions. Um, and like I said, it's really was in public sphere that a lot of this marketing was coming out. Uh, things that changed that, uh, 1922, AT&T, uh, which I was interested to find, AT&T, uh, did the first radio commercial on uh, station WEAF in New York. So the big shift to this was, you know, before marketing was just in the public area, but now it's kind of invading your homes. So they could send the messages directly to you while you were in your house. So there wasn't a really easy way. I mean, you could shut off the radio. You could not read the paper. But marketing slowly starts to infiltrate itself into our daily lives and then to our households. Um, privacy becomes a big concern at this point. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, there was a lot of hatred for marketing folks and the jobs they were doing. I mean, they just thought that they were just, you know, polluting our brains and crowding us with all these messages uh, and, and being able to get away from those is becoming increasingly harder. Uh, I mean, if you, if you think about nowadays, how many times you're touched with an advertisement or some type of sell, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's mind blowing. And it's almost to the point where it's, it's so accepted that we don't even, don't even notice. And, you know, like I said, good marketing uh, gets the message across without you knowing it, but there's some bad marketing. It just doesn't do anything. <laughs> but with all that, I mean, this is what it's like. I mean, it's constant bombardment, you know, who, you know, buy a better car, buy the better clothes. Uh, it just, there was a lot of negative association with marketing. And again, at this point, it's still very one-sided. So we're being fed all these things and we really don't have a uh, a forum or a way to communicate unless you know you want to call the business or things like that but there was no real-time communication um which makes it you know a little hard for the consumer <laughs> uh and then you know we get into a new dawn so even though all these people were so angry in this invasion of privacy uh, it, you know, it gave way. Te you know, radio and television became more commonplace. I mean, we got used to seeing commercials and carrying commercials. You know, and over time, uh, that evolution, it, you know, gave way to the internet and digital ads. Uh, there was this, you know, company Google that had a crazy idea of selling clicks, or you know, how being able to track how many times things are read or seen. I mean, it just became, you know, very commonplace and all these different algorithms and different companies kind of jump on board. And the Internet really opens up the marketing sphere because now we have access to cheaper ways of delivering messages. You know, the, the days of spending a thousand dollars on one newspaper ad, you spend a thousand dollars on the Internet and you can advertise for months. So it really changes the game all around, not just for those folks that are selling things or people trying to get their messages across, but for the consumers as well. Um, as you know, algorithms start to detect, you know, what we like and what we dislike and start feeding us ads, um, it really becomes very personable and very targeted. And, you know, with a lot of good and bad, obviously, but, you know, from our standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, small businesses trying to get those messages across. I mean, it's a fantastic advancement and a really good way, fairly inexpensively, to get a messaging across and to sell products. I think an interesting um, example of how advertisement has just completely taken over is that in this new internet age, the consumer has become the marketer in a lot of uh, in a lot of ways you might be scrolling on your feed and you see someone posted a picture and it's just of you know their feet and a drink at the beach but they've tagged the resort they're staying at 
the bar that they got the drink from, the brand of the alcohol that they're drinking, all of that is now clickable content. And you can go directly to that company's page and they never paid that person to advertise for them in the first place. So it's become this interesting dynamic where um, people are just as much involved in the advertising that they're consuming. Um, whereas before that was, it was that one sided, everything was coming directly from, and now we're actually pointing other people back to, uh, back to companies for them, so. Right, and that's what what we're touching on here. I mean, consumers now enter the conversation. So this is a whole new realm, and at first it is. It's it's messy. It's it's uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, trolls and, and people putting things down. But I mean, now people have a voice, and they have a real time voice. So as you dip your toes into this new digital age, I mean, as you release something. That's why it's important now to really focus on your brand, to really focus on your messaging, because when you put it out there, it's out there. And it's not like it was, you know, with a newspaper ad, maybe so many thousand people see it. Things go across the world uh, within minutes. So you really want to be very deliberate in the things that you're doing, the things that you're saying, mm -hmm. um, because consumers, you know, they're going to put you in your place, uh, whatever they can. Uh, so this is, this is very important. This is a, this is a good thing to, to kind of jot down. You know, everybody has something to say, but knowing what you want to say and how you want to say it is it more important than ever. Like I said, you really want to kind of craft and really hone in on your messaging because people remember it's, you know, the internet's forever. My mom always, you know, says that, uh, <laughs> Which, you know, is true. I mean, you, you want to be able to control your narrative. And, you know, if, if, if you're, you're trying to be personable and you're trying to make those connections, you want to be genuine. And people will pick up when you're not very quickly on the Internet. Um, so it is very important to know what you want to say and to have all those ducks in a row, if you will, before you get out there and start using platforms. Um, to spread your message. It's like we're going really fast. So I hope, I hope <laughs> we stretch this out. All right. So here we go. Here's what, you know, what we're building for today. This is this is the top billing stuff. Uh, so this is uh, really exactly what it says. This is a very much a crash course. Uh, these are kind of the things that as we were asked to do this presentation, we thought, Okay, here's, here's some core things that we can cover that make sense that, you know, hopefully if we do our job well uh, and, and convey it, that will, you know, kind of give you a leg up and kind of a little bit of insight. Or, or maybe, you know, we'll talk and you you do all this stuff and, you know, just confirms that you're on the right path. Or, hey, maybe we'll surprise you and you'll say, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, either way, uh, you're here for the durations. Let's, let's buckle in. Let's get into it. So <laughs> things that we're used to. So when we get involved with a lot of clients, uh, they're just getting ready to start a, a digital campaign or kind of dip their toes into those type of things. They're, they're used to doing the newspapers, the mailers, the billboards, TV and radio ads. And the, the nice thing about those, there are certain demographics that still really absorb uh, for those different mediums. But, you know, you hit a certain age demographic. Uh, I mean, our local newspaper is not produced here locally anymore. So newspaper is kind of a dying breed. I mean, you have access to all that news all the time on the internet. And, you know, it's getting piped in through your uh, Spotify account. You're listening to podcasts. Uh, newspapers are slowly starting to die out. Now, the nice thing about a newspaper or a magazine um, they have kind of had a little bit of an uptick, especially magazines within the last couple of years. And the reason being for that is that the millennials, uh, the, the idea of being able to control, you know, I can, I can read that magazine, I can close it and it's not bothering me anymore. So you get to control that experience a little bit more. It's a little bit more tactile. Uh, there is a sense of nostalgia for that type of thing. Uh, mailers, uh, We've done a handful of mailers. Mailers are nice for certain things, but for the most part, the only people calling them mailers are the people that are selling them. Uh, it's junk mail. 
a lot of people uh, they don't that this, they glaze right over it and just throw it right in the trash. Um, it really depends on the situation, and that's something definitely I would talk to if you have a marketing person. If you're looking to do a mailer, they're super expensive, and the payout isn't super great. Some of the things that people don't take in consideration when you buy those mailer lists or that. Those lists aren't scrubbed. So, for example, at my address, I'm the fifth homeowner. So I get everything in vibes. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the crapshoot with mailers. You buy a mailing list. You don't know if all those addresses are valid or people are getting those. Uh, you're paying per address, per uh, per mailer. So, again, it's, it's a little messy. There are certain situations where mailers work great, but for the most part, they're they're kind of a tough to recoup your investment. Uh, billboards are kind of that same boat. Digital billboards, super cool. Messages constantly rotate, but billboards are kind of coming the way of um, we're just used to them, right? Uh, there's not a lot of situations that I can think of where I saw them on a billboard. And I'm like, oh great, I'll write that down. You know, the first thing I want to do is go to someone's Facebook page, or I'm going to go uh, to their website, or do a quick Google search. Uh, billboards are nice for instant call to action. Uh, if you're trying to, you know, pump up a big event, billboards on busy intersections obviously is a great investment. Uh, but for the most part, uh, depending on how you're going to do this, how you're going to try to convey your message, the target audience that you're trying to reach, um, that money could be better spent elsewhere. Uh, that's kind of the point of this whole little this whole little segment is going to be. You know, all these forms of advertising have their perks and they have their negatives. But, you know, being able to discern what you're trying to do so you can better spend your money towards the things that work best for you, that's kind of what we're going to get across here. Uh, same thing with TV and radio ads. I mean, uh, again, there's an expense there depending on your demographic. But think about how, you know, people pay extra not to have commercials on their Hulu or on their TV. Uh, you know, people that pay for premium audio accounts so they don't get those commercials. Uh, a lot of people are doing that streaming. A lot of people listen to satellite radio. So again, there's a certain demographic where some of that stuff works well, uh, but it's really gonna be about figuring out who your audience is and what you're trying to do. I think that this brand of marketing, this, this generation of marketing, um, of the newspapers and the mailers and the billboards is kind of what led to um, small businesses and smaller communities um, starting to not see the value of marketing because you're competing with other larger brands that have a lot more money and have whole creative teams. And so it's kind of created this, eh, I, they're not going to look at my ad any more than they're going to look at the McDonald's ad that's right next to it or you know, the Burger King ad that's coming on afterwards or Dillard's or whatever it is that might be happening in that same kind of stratosphere. And there was no ability to, you could personalize things and you could be, you could be personable, but there was no active way for you to kind of see if your customer base was liking what you were putting out. That was a lot harder to track for, you know, smaller businesses that aren't Nikes and McDonald's. And I think that's what really led to um, this new in the way that we do things now. Yeah. Well, if I could interject, um, I'm, you know, following everything that you're saying. And that was that is one thing that we deal with on a daily basis is we have um, small business owners who do the social media on their own um, and it becomes quite a burden. And then we also have small businesses or even larger corporations that don't see the merit in marketing their products um, or they leave it up to, hey, this guy can use Microsoft Publisher. We'll just let him do the marketing. So I think communicating to our businesses the importance of marketing and the importance of dedicating a specific amount of money toward marketing. I think that's where you guys come in because you do give them cost effective ways of getting their message across without really breaking the bank. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and you also, you give ideas, Hey, you could do this and, and you tailor what your services are to the business itself. You don't just have, this is what you're going to get and this is how much it's going to cost you tailor mm -hmm. that. So, 
that is, I think that's what set you sets you guys apart. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, that's a, a great point. I think a great example of that, um, something we got to do this year for the Ross County Chamber of Commerce. Um, they, you know, had a few vacancies in the downtown area and our downtown really has seen a resurgence, but obviously with the pandemic, you know, that put a damper on some businesses and made some things, you know, kind of flow in and out. And one of the creative solutions that we got to do um, was creating banners that went on the inside of these vacant windows. And Jared created these awesome scenes that looked like people were working, living, laughing, having a good time. And then it said, you know, you know, make this dream a reality, rent this space, here's your information. Um, and it was just something that was fun and different and still, you know, felt like in the vein of a traditional marketing campaign, but it had a little more interest to it. It was a little more eye catching. It was a little more personalized and tailored to the Ross County Chamber of Commerce. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we specialize in is tailoring to our clients because Southern Ohio, it, it's a different market. Mm -hmm. Things aren't a hundred percent digital here quite yet. You know, we still have a very large portion of our state that doesn't have access to quality high speed broadband internet. Um, so having that tailored solution of, hey, here's what we can do and we can save you a lot of money on traditional things by pushing this social media content. But then that money that you're saving, we can take and do something really cool that is a physical marketing campaign and using the two of those to complement each other, help um, reach this very hyper specific audience in a whole different way. Right. And that's, that's what this slide really conveys. I mean, Southern Ohio is a pretty good mix of physical advertising and digital advertising because there are limitations in the rural areas with, with certain things. Um, and like I said, especially with our resurgence of downtown, that tactile feel of paper and posters, people I mean, are like that. I mean, they, want, they want to buy prints. They want to have something physical. Um, but we also have a pretty good population that's pretty tech savvy and want to do all their information online. So, you know, it's it's been... You know, challenging, but one of the, the better parts of our job is, you know, find now, you know, what works best for what and really be able to, to hyper focus and, and, and direct people in a direction that maybe they didn't think of originally uh, or maybe reach an audience that they never even thought they could reach. And this is just some examples of just, you know, there's all these different forms. I mean, there's stickers there's signs, posters, magazines, T-shirts. Uh, a lot of logos on the side of vehicles. There's all these little ways to kind of get your brand out there, uh, let people see it, um, and, and really, you know, hone in your message. Uh, a lot of this stuff here we've done. Uh, we, we've been, we've got to have some fun with some of it. The Mama Pia show was really, really kind of cool. Uh, if you look up our Great Seal Living, that's a local magazine that we have to help participate with. Uh, that's a monthly publication. Uh, another fun project that's up there, we get to do the uh, Trails book. So that's another great thing, especially about Ross County. I mean, we have five state parks uh, right here in Ross County. So that's that's been a fun project. And again, Tecumseh, Tecumseh is really big for us. I uh, do a lot of work with them. So this slide's kind of like, you know, okay. So we just kind of just threw up a lot about the, you know, the marketing and the evolution of marketing and, and some kind of some basics. Um, so what does that all mean for everybody that's on this call? Uh, well, that's that's the next process of this. So how do we determine, you know, uh, who we're trying to convey our message to? Maybe we don't even know what our messaging is yet. Maybe we're a new business and we're still trying to get our legs out from, and figure out, you know, what's the next steps. Um, and this is, you know, one of the situations where you're really going to get with your team and get with the people you're working with. And, and you've got to figure out, uh, especially nowadays. I mean, it, it's very important to be able to tell stories. Uh, the majority of the people that are consuming, the majority of the people that we're trying to reach are in an age demographic where they want that personable connection. Uh, but they also want it to be easy. So that's a challenge coming from a nonprofit area is, you know, how, how do we, you know, increase donations, increase involvement, but still keep it easy. Uh, I know that it's, it's kind of, <laughs> 
it's kind of, you know, when you say that, it seems a little in, insensitive, but it's true. I mean, people want to do good, but they want to do it on their own terms. So, you know, how how do we, you know, you, you get with your people and you figure out, okay, here's, here's the product, here's the message. Now, you know, who are we trying to tell this to? How are we going to say it? Um, so the, the more transparent and the more personal you can be with your messaging and your products and your business, uh, the, the better reception you're going to have from the people that you're trying to reach. So, you know, there's, there's some, some thought processes behind this. So number one thing to really hone in on is you need to know your target audience. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm selling, uh, you know, uh, video games, obviously my target model audience is a, a younger crowd between the ages of, you know, 15 to, you know, 25. Uh, obviously, older people do play games, and that's a target that you know you would get to. But the, the majority of your clientele are going to be within a certain demographic or a certain uh, thought processes. Uh, so, how do you really know? You know, who is my target audience? Who am I trying to reach? And that's that's the thing you really need to sit down and hone in on with you know your team or with yourself even. Because if you don't know who you're trying to target, how can you possibly come up with your messaging in an effective way to relay that? Um, there's a lot of clients that we work with that have a few different demographics they're trying to hit, and we tailor each solution to those specific demographics. Uh, the way that you word something is going to appeal to a certain age group, the way that the, the colors you decide on, um, the different things you, you use to relay that messages, like we talked about, newspapers, billboards, those are for a certain demographic of people. But really knowing your audience is the most important key to all this because you need to know who you're talking to. I think um, a great example that I can give uh, one of the social media accounts that we run um, is their clientele base is fairly large um, and they're a store so they kind of encompass people of all ages but the audience that has surrounded them on their Facebook platform is an older audience right that that 45 to 65 kind of audience and when I go into thinking about the kind of content that I'm going to create for them it's things that are softer in color um, very kind friendly warm inviting wording um, everything is very simple everything is very easy on the eyes because I know that my audience is not going to respond well to bright harsh colors and lots of flash and movement um, and I think that <clears throat> that it's just a great example of you know you can really do anything with social media but if I was creating you know content that I would want to see from that client um, I don't think that we would have quite the relationship and rapport that has been built up. There are several people who are regularly commenting and sharing and interacting because they feel like that store has an actual physical presence that reminds them of the people they see when they're in there. Um, and it feels personable. It feels like they're talking to a friend. Um, and it's a totally different way that I approach almost any other social media account that we have. And like I said, my background, I, I came from a nonprofit and I had a, 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 a boss there that I reported to and I would come up with these marketing campaigns. And one of the things that hired me for was to reach a younger crowd. So this was for a Goodwill. And Goodwill's customer typically is an older customer, a thrift store client. Um, but obviously, you know, there is a, a, a huge resurgence of this, you know, found articles of the generation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of younger people going to thrift shops and thrift stores. So, you know, they hired me and they really wanted to kind of target those people. And I would come up with these ads and my boss would always, he would always look at it and he would think, and he would say out loud, I guess, would my mom understand this? And I always had to remind him like, look, your mom is not the target here. You know what I mean? Your mom's already shopping here. That's not the demographic we're trying to hit. This messaging is specific to that. So I think if, if, if you're a small business or if you're you know a marketing person on here, just trying to you know, get some insight, uh, it really, you gotta you gotta think less about what you respond to and what the target is going to respond to. There's a lot of things that I think are cool, but are probably not cool.
<laughs> There's probably a lot of those things. So, you know, my particular interest may not be the target audience. So we really do, uh, I think, a, a, a really good job of really doing our research and looking into those things. Um, with our marketing, obviously, with our, you know, with the slides and stuff, this is our brand. I mean, it is kind of loud. It is kind of bright. There's a lot of textures. But that's who we are. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of loud. You know, we're, we, we stick out a little bit. So, you know, we we really have a lot of fun with our marketing. And there's some clients where, you know, it's not so much fun, but it's just straightforward. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, we really need to understand who we're trying to reach so we can reach them effectively. Jared, I have a question. Yeah. Have you ever had a client come to you um, who have been in business for, say, 20 years? And they've never had any kind of marketing. Um, they've never done any. They just do like an ad in the paper or something like that. And they come to you and they're just like, I don't know what my message is. I don't know who my demographic is. Um, people come in if they need bread. So how do you deal with folks like that? And how do you convey to them the need to understand that? Or do you just take that on for them? Well, it, it all kind of depends. So when we bring on a client, um, we have a, a little bit of a questionnaire that kind of is a series of basic questions that again, over time we've kind of put together this list and this idea. And it really, some of the questions, actually one of the, my favorite questions is, you know, what's your elevator speech? And uh, that's when things kind of get fun. Cause some people, when you hear the word elevator speech have no idea what we're talking about, but you know, an elevator speech, and especially if you've been in sales, you've, you've done elevator speeches. But it's, you know, what if, I mean, the question is, if, if someone asks you, what is your product? What do you do? What is that that paragraph that you relay that would kind of talk about your, you know, your mission statement, your, your passion? Um, so when we get a new client, that's one of those questions on there. And sometimes they're like, well, I don't, I don't know. So that's when we would get into sitting down with them and kind of help them craft that and come up with that elevator speech. Because... Like I said, we, we can't stress enough how important it is to know that target. And you really got to know yourself. And, and to answer your question, we've had a few people like that where they've come in. Uh, and again, especially during the pandemic, because, you know, these people were physically open. It was word of mouth. It was foot traffic. Mm -hmm. And they had no idea how to reach that digital audience. They, some, some had no idea how to even get their business online. Mm -hmm. um, and we helped quite a few people kind of convert that brick and mortar mentality into this digital. And now that things are picking back up, they're doing both. Mm -hmm. um, but again, to answer your question, it, it all depends on the client. Some of them really want to do that work and participate and be involved in that. And some of them are just like, you know what, here are the things I sell, here's the target, what should my messaging be? And we do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the the best clients though are the ones that really really jump in with us that really like to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that that marketing aside from a business standpoint, I mean, those people tend to be the most passionate and the people that tend to do really well because, I mean, the number one reason a salesperson fails is they don't believe in the product they're selling. Mm -hmm. So as a business owner, as, you know, someone putting out a messaging like a nonprofit, you got to be able to appreciate, understand, and buy into your own messaging. Because if you don't believe it, it's not going to work. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, definitely the people that do the work are the ones that, that tend to have the best campaigns and tend to, you know, give us a little bit of freedom and do really good work with. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this is a really cool slide here. So again, my background, I, I love psychology. I love sociology and I love the, 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 the psychology behind marketing. Um, so as you're looking for your target audience, uh, there's demographics and there's psychographics. So I thought this was a really cool slide. So your demographics are your, you know, your, your, your census information, you know, married or single, male or female, age, job, location, salary. These are things that, you know, you can have access to pretty much anything, anywhere. Um, psychographics, which I really love, or, you know, the, the personal side, the messaging side. So, you know, maybe they love to travel, maybe they're an avid hiker, family time, frugal with money, love tax products, uh, eats a healthy diet, 
So these are the things that as a marketing person, these are the things that really fascinate me. These are the things that our group really likes to focus on is those emotional responses. Um, our job at the end of the day is to elicit some sort of emotional response. Um, that's why we love working with nonprofits. Um, so, you know, you can target people by age and by, you know, jobs, but unless you entice them emotionally, get them invested in what you're trying to sell, it's just, you know, another one of those hurdles you have to overcome. So really kind of thinking outside of those standard census things, you know, what are the likes and the dislikes and the things that I'm trying to sell people or the things I'm trying to tell people? What, what can I, how can I word that? How can I make it visually so that it invokes an emotional response? Um, one of the best things that I've read as far as like uh, marketing conversations, I mean, you can get customers with marketing. Um, you know, you can sell pretty much anything, but it's that line of communication. A customer that has an emotional response is a better customer. When they believe in your product, they believe in your service. Um, when they connect something that is personally uh, important to them to what you're trying to do, that just makes them a customer for life. And it's, it's definitely worth the work and the effort and the time to figure that out and how to convey that. Um, and you'll find too that with those type of relationships, those type of customers are your favorite kind of customers to work with. Those are going to be your favorite donors. Uh, those are the people that really are going to follow you along and help you be successful. No. Good on the slide. All right. So this leads us to another very important portion of marketing is the importance and the power of brand. Um, when we first got into this, like I said, we made logos. And to me, a logo is just a graphical representation of your business. But a brand is the total package. So if you think about your logo as um, you know, your, uh, your, your driver's license. <laughs> That's the picture of your driver's license. The brand's gonna be the information. The brand's gonna be the personality. Uh, branding is everything from your color choice to your messaging to how you convey yourself online and print, uh, the tone you take with things. Some brands are, you know, safe. Some brands are intentionally uncomfortable to invoke a response. Uh, a great example of the importance and power of brand, uh, think about Old Spice, right? So when I was younger, my great grandpa used Old Spice and it was that little ugly white ceramic, god awful smelling jar on uh, the sink and in, uh, in the bathroom. And then, you know, they, they finally found out that they were losing their customers and they had to approach and kind of bring in, you know, the younger crowd. And to think about how their marketing has completely changed and their messaging has completely changed. And now it's actually to the point where it's a part of pop culture. So, I mean, that's, that's a great example of a brand pivoting and adapting to a, a different demographic, a different market. You know, they, they went from, uh, you know, that, that ugly packaging to bright reds. They, they started using fun words and having funny commercials. Um, and that's, that's the idea that we kind of have here. So maybe you're new and you're trying to figure out your brand. And that's things that they take in consideration. Um, or maybe like Old Spice, you have a, a, a customer base that is slowly dwindling and you need to pivot. How do you pivot? How can you make your product or messaging relevant to now? Um, there's, there's just not enough emphasis on the importance of brand that we can say, because that's everything that you do. And to be able to do that consistently is the chore, is the, is the hard part of all of this. Um, but the brand is the most important asset that you own. So no matter what you're doing or what you're selling or trying to convey, your brand is your personal stake in the game. And to have a good, strong brand and be a consistent brand is, is a huge part of this. Um, I like to think of branding as a, a company's personality. So, you know, when you get ready for, for your day, 
you have a particular way that you like to do your hair, a particular style of clothing that you're going to choose every time more than likely than not, you know, every, everything about what you do um, to get ready to present yourself to the world is trying to convey to other people what you want them to know about you. Do I want them to see me as really creative and different? Do I want them to see me um, as a reflection of themselves? Do I want them to see me as this bold, strong, powerful person? Everything that you do, whether it's subconscious or conscious, you're, you're making those decisions to tell the world who you are. And branding is, you know, the suit jacket that you're that your company wears, you know, is it, is it navy? Is it bright red? Is it purple? And what does that tell people about, you know, who you are and what you stand for and what you do? So this is another part of that psychology that I really love. And this is something that we go over with all of our clients, especially our new branding clients. Um, and sometimes more often than not, it really, kind of blows people's minds. <laughs> uh, so like I said, with marketing, it, there's so much psychology behind marketing. And a big part of that is color psychology. So the colors you pick or the colors you want to pick for your brand convey certain things. And again, the reason why they convey the things they do is because of marketing. Um, these colors were just one's colors. With, with marketing, these are now the meanings of those. So kind of some of the fun ones, uh, we use blue a lot. Blue is uh, strength, uh, confidence, intelligence, responsibility. Uh, think about a, a lot of uh, different companies that use blue in the logos, IBM, Goodwill. Uh, you know, that's strength, that's reliability. Uh, green is usually uh, you know, youth, organic, growth, uh, money. Uh, black, elegance, authority, respect. Um, I think it's funny when people use a lot of orange. I mean, it does mean energy and fun. Uh, it also means caution. So be careful on that one. Uh, and then, you know, it's just, these are all the things to consider when you're doing your logo, when you're doing your marketing, uh, how you want to come across. I mean, a bank using, you know, bright pink may be a little bit like, oh, I don't know about that. Or, you know, maybe you're, uh, you know, trying to sell, uh, I don't know, cakes and you end up picking, you know, brown. Sure, maybe it's chocolate, but I mean, that's it's, it's not going to pop. It's not going to catch people's attention. So really kind of considering what these colors mean and how they relate to people uh, is super important. Um, a great example, uh, Nickelodeon is up there for orange. And, you know, when when kid TV first started, um, Disney Channel was, you know, the channel that parents could confidently, you know, click on Disney Channel and, and be sure that their children weren't going to be exposed to anything that maybe they weren't looking for it to do. It was kind of for, you know, the more cautious parent and their logo, their branding is blue. It all centered around blue. They had the blue ear thing that they did. Um, and then you look at Nickelodeon, which aired, you know, your your traditional trash cartoons like SpongeBob and Ren and Stimpy that maybe were catered to a little more of an edgy audience. And you see that reflected in the idea of, you know, orange is fun, but it also means caution. I think that's a really interesting thing to look at yeah. as the color. Uh, another thing that goes along with color is font. Um, and, I, and this is something that maybe you've picked up on your own or maybe, you know, you, you, you wonder why these certain things uh, make you feel or uh, make you see things a different way. Uh, fonts are a huge part of what we do when it comes to branding. Uh, a lot of times, uh, I know for me, and again, any other designers on the phone, they may have a different approach, uh, but I usually start with font. So depending on the client, um, you know, are they are they trying to, uh, is it a restaurant? Is it a jewelry store? Uh, are they a construction company? Uh, there's a lot of times uh, a font can really say a lot about a company. And if you look at the ones up here, like I love the ones for tradition. So a lot of your, uh, your Minion Pro uh, timeless fonts uh, fall along that tradition. 
uh, stability. So it, has, it still has the softness of some of the round shapes, but it's also a very bold font, very you know, straight, strong. Look at the sharp edges and uh, the, the curve on that G, the way the roundness is. I mean, that's it's a strong font. Uh, elegance, again, anything that uh, we don't use a lot of elegance. I think they're not a great choice for logos because sometimes they're hard to read, but sometimes it is appropriate. Uh, you know, jewelry stores, uh, you know, wedding venues, uh, things like that use a lot of elegant fonts. Uh, and then the friendly font, we've been using those quite a bit here lately. There's a big trend right now for these fat, chunky, really curvy fonts. Uh, and that's the other thing that I definitely encourage is your look. And I mean, you, you want to look at trends, but you don't want to be too trendy, if that makes sense. Uh, the importance of a brand is longevity. You can reinvent, you can adjust but your core message should really always stay the same. And how do you convey that in a way that is timeless? Um, we do see a lot of people kind of fall victim to trends and things not holding up well. Uh, so, you know, if you're working with a designer or you're doing it yourself, I mean, these are things to consider. I mean, it's, it's, it's all very important. And, and like I said, with a lot of clients we start working with and we start going over these things, uh, a lot of times they just have no idea. And, you know, it, it's, there's, there's a, hundreds of examples I can think of personally, and you can too, of maybe somebody that had a great message or a really cool product, the marketing completely turned you off or the font they used on their logo was like, oh, that's just inappropriate, you know, or, or maybe, you know, their, their logo was too on the nose. I mean, that's the other, another way to kind of look at these things. How do you find a happy medium without, you know, how do you convey your message without being, you know, right on the nose with it? Uh, one of the things that you learn as a graphic designer is, you know, just because uh, it's a car company doesn't mean the logo has to have a car in it. You know, what's the messaging behind that? What's the personal connection? How can we, you know, take, you know, that, that market that they're trying to reach and do that in a creative way that maybe is different uh, and maybe is uh, not the norm, but still is on brand. Um, so a lot of thought process goes into the branding portion of that. So I would encourage if you're, you know, just starting up or maybe again, you're reviewing your current customer list, your current donor list, and you want to pivot or change those type of things. These are the things to keep in mind when you're doing that. Uh, another important messaging uh, that we've kind of learned over the years is work your market. Uh, so a really good example is with us is, uh, so Chilcotty, Ohio, is a, it's, a, it's a mill town, it's a paper town. Uh, a lot of our industry, a lot of this place grew up around the paper mill. Uh, I've been here my entire life. So the paper mill to me means something different than somebody who's visiting or somebody who's, uh, you know, just a, a transplant. I mean, the, the smokestack, even though it's industrial and it's stinky sometimes, I mean, that's home. So, you know, for us, we use a lot of that symbolism and a lot of that pride that goes into that. There are a lot of people that feel the same way. So when you're looking at your market and you're looking at your customer base, you know, what are those things within your area that makes that area special? How can you use what your area is known for to your advantage? Um, how can you, you know, invoke that pride and get that buy-in from the public? Uh, it, it really just, you know, everybody has a, a small town or, or something that they're known for. What is that? Um, you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, it's, it's rare, but maybe there isn't something. So maybe you make something. Maybe you make your market known for something. At any rate, you need to look on, look around what's going on and how you can use those things to your advantage. And, you know, when you work your market, you understand your clientele better. You understand your target better. Um, you know, we, we're, we're fortunate in the way that, you know, we get to work a lot with, our local community, so you know we're we're really good at that. You know, you put us in a market we're not familiar with. The first thing we're going to do is look at that market and see what it's known for. Um, you know, history is important. Symbolism is important. These are all things that you know really consider as you're trying to put together your messaging and your brand. And I think that it it's really genuinely one of the easiest ways to go about marketing because it you know, your market should be natural to you. It, it's something that is almost second nature. You know, to joke about the smokestack is second nature in Chillicothe. 
um, you know, we love the phrase smells like money. And that's what people um, have come to say because it can be, as Jared said, quite stinky at times. But, you know, there's a there's a local love for it. And I think sometimes you can get uh, brands specifically, companies can get nervous to kind of um, jab or joke at themselves or be too niche. But in the world that we're in right now, everything is about the niche. You know, any any big company can throw up a piece of advertising with a beautiful model and a, a great looking background or a cool looking product, and that's fine. But not many companies can go into your market and make a joke or a reference or um, a jab at something that evokes that emotional response that we were talking about. So that leads us into uh, a pretty detailed section here. So social media, and I put a little scary on there because uh, a lot of our clients, especially again, here in Southern Ohio, uh, a lot of people are afraid of social media. Uh, and a lot of it is because of, you know, a few things. I mean, we've all heard the, the term troll. I mean, there are people on the internet who just like to stir the pot, who like to just tear things down. You know, how do you control those type of things? I mean, your customers can talk real time. Uh, you know, how, how do we have the staff or how do we respond to these certain things? Uh, how, how can we make sure that, you know, we, we, we say things on social media and they're taken in the correct context and not taken out of context? and, and and cause issues for us. Um, there's a lot to social media that is bad, but there's also a ton of good things about social media. Uh, a lot of our clients around the pandemic came to us and you know, one of the first things we always recommend is, I mean, do you have a Facebook account? And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, I mean, the main one being interacting with your community and your clients, but also, you know, and we'll touch on this in a little bit, you know, algorithms, you know, search engines, how, how when people go into Google and they look for, you know, food pantries, or they look for, you know, handmade purses, you know, how do we ensure that you know, we were to show up in those Google searches or people are even going to connect with us online without us directly talking to them. So there's a lot to social media that can be a little alarming and a little scary, but it's definitely your best resource if you're trying to reach certain demographics. So what we're going to dive into here are this, these are the main social media platforms. So one of the big tasks that you're going to have to deal with, uh, and if you're not dealing with it already, is you know which platform is the best platform for what I'm trying to do. So we have you know Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Twitter, TikTok. People love TikTok and uh, YouTube, and I and I think it's funny because when we say YouTube, a lot of people don't think it's YouTube as a social network, but it's one of the largest. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're going to do is kind of dive into uh, the weeds a little. This is going to be a lot of information. Uh, try not to bore you too terribly much, but I think this is this is a huge part of this. So if you're going to get into the digital realm, you know which platform. And there's going to be one that's better for what you're doing than others. So how do we determine that? And as we get into this, I think it's important to emphasize that everything we've talked about up until this point is going to make or break your experience on social media. The social media can be scary because it seems like all of these platforms and all of these things and algorithms and everything. But when you know what you're trying to say, who you're trying to say it to, what you want it to look like. When you have all of those pieces already together, you can start to look at this information that we're going to go over now, and you can already have an idea of, oh, I don't even need this. This is going to be much better suited. So that's where all of what we've talked about kind of comes into play with this, into making social media a more um, attainable and realistic marketing option for your business. Yeah, and, and for those that are kind of tracking along, think about this, this, this flow that we've had. So we've talked about where we've come from for marketing. We've talked about how marketing has invaded our lives talked about making it personal. And then as we got into this marketing part, I mean, these are the things you're thinking about, you know, who is my target audience? How do I cater my brand to that audience? So now we're getting into, okay, we have our audience, we have our brand. Now what do we do with all this? Mm -hmm. 
So to get to the different platforms, so obviously the most popular platform today is Facebook. Uh, I'm not going to read off all these statistics on here, but just going to have them up for you. Uh, I believe that this, this slideshow may be downloadable or maybe recorded. At any rate, uh, Facebook is really kind of your uh, fail safe, right? Unless you're dealing with a really older generation, really young generation, Facebook is a great place because of you know the age gaps there that people use. Now, the ages, the most common users are males between 25 and 34, females 18 to 24. Uh, so like I said, the really young crowds are kind of leaning towards different social networks, but this is a nice place to kind of really evenly get uh, a good mix of different people. There are currently 2.8 billion daily active users as of 2021. So uh, the information up there is a little bit data. I'm looking at a new one I just found today. Uh, it is the number one most popular social media network. And then another thing to consider as you're delivering your messaging, as you're coming up with your content, how are people accessing the con content? So 98%, 98% of people who consume content on Facebook are doing it via their phone. So that's something to really consider with your brand and your marketing is how you know you want to format it to the social media platform that you're trying to communicate through. So there are certain file types for Facebook, and we'll kind of cover that to the different groups. Uh, but you really want to be intentional and create content specific for these different social media places. Um, video ads do better on the Facebook than still ads. Videos are coming very, very popular. Video gets a lot more views than still photography. And if you're going to use still photography, keep in mind all those things we talked about. Color, font, delivery. What are you trying to convey? Uh, this Facebook.com is the world's third most viewed website. So, I mean, there's a ton of traffic, ton of people on Facebook. There are a ton of people that participate in Facebook groups. That's another great marketing tool is look at those groups. Are there groups that are built around the things that you're trying to accomplish, the things you're trying to sell? How do you become part of those groups? How do you market to those groups? People within those demographics and that information is readily available when you do your target ads. Uh, so Facebook is a really great tool. Uh, We'll just kind of say right off the bat, uh, Facebook's probably going to be where you get most of your interactions. So Facebook's one of those if you get involved with, really got to be on top of. Um, one of the services that we offer for our clients is we manage all that. So if people come in and there's a negative comment, we're really quick to respond or shut it down before it gets carried away. That's really one of the biggest fears that we kind of, one of the biggest objections we overcome with our clients is, you know, how, how do we track this and keep tabs on it and don't let it get away from us? So it's very important if you're going to get involved in any social media networks that you're able to dedicate that kind of time and understanding to it. Uh, the next we're going to touch on is Instagram. So Instagram, a uh, little bit younger crowd, uh, mostly uh, if you're familiar with Instagram, it's very photo and picture driven. Facebook allows you to post news articles and link websites and sell things. Instagram is really all about being visual. So if you're going to compete in Instagram, uh, there are very specific uh, markets that really do well on Instagram. If you're selling, you know, handmade items, selling furniture, interior design, anything that would, you know, make a great picture, those are the people you're looking at on this kind of platform. Uh, the average Instagram user spends 30 minutes per day on the platform. I mean, think about it, 30 dedicated minutes, every user looking through content. And it is all very visually digestible. Um, so if you're going to compete and, and, and mess with the Instagram, you want to make sure that your content is very vivid, very visually stimulating. Uh, as you can see, the population on uh, Instagram is split almost directly right down the middle between male and female. So you get a good mix of uh, that type of thing. And again, Instagram's owned by Facebook, so you do have the ability to target very specific when you go into your ads and paid clicks. Um, we always recommend trying to do as much as you can organically first. And, and, and if you're not familiar with what that means, it's just being able to build an audience and communicate, interact with your audience without having to pay for anything. Um, paid clicks are great for reporting. 
but it's kind of a hard measurable, you know, who, who's clicking is actually interested. So you really want to get, you know, an organic fan base with a lot of these and really interact with them. And that's, that's going to be the key is going to interact and post good content. Something that's really interesting about Instagram is that in the last two years or so, it's really taken this hard pivot. Um, whereas before it was, a little more focused on connection. Um, it has taken this very hard pivot toward sales. So everything in Instagram, if you want it to be, is clickable. Um, you can take a picture in a pair in a set of clothes, and you can link directly to that item that you're wearing on that brand's website, whether it's your own brand or somebody else. Um, and even so far as to have shops set up within Instagram. Um, so, it, you know, like Jared said, if it's something that's, you know, you're selling homemade, you're selling art, interior design, decor, furniture, all of that kind of stuff, um, Instagram really enables you to kind of market and sell and have a website all kind of in one little area without actually having to have all of those things so it's really great um etsy is really popular and a lot of etsy creators um have kind of shifted to instagram they still have their things on etsy but instagram just has such a wider reach of people and it's so because everything is visual it's a lot easier to just put up a picture link to it and then that item can be sold a couple of really quick uh, things to keep in mind. 90% of Instagram users are following a business profile. So uh, there's 90% of people that are specifically following businesses. 83% of the users are discovering new products and services daily. So Instagram is pretty huge. Now, uh, believe it or not, fourth most used social media network. Fourth. Didn't know that. Pretty cool. Uh, we might blow through some of these pretty fast because uh, we're, it's, we're getting a short time. <laughs> uh, LinkedIn, believe it or not, LinkedIn is a social media uh, website. It's more for business professionals. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, you know, everybody gets the emails. So someone's adding to the professional network. Really the nice thing about uh, LinkedIn, if you're looking to connect uh, for business to business leads, Instagram, or, uh, LinkedIn's great for that. 80% business to business leads come from LinkedIn. Uh, so if you're looking to uh, maybe, you know, you're a uh, recruiter or maybe you're uh, a business consultant, uh, these are things. These are the people that are in this market. These are professionals. Uh, other nice fact about this, 80% of the people on LinkedIn are making the business decisions. So maybe you're trying to get in, uh, maybe you own a cleaning business and you're looking to clean some offices. There's a lot of things to consider when you're trying to narrow down your social media network. Uh, ages for this tend to be the uh, the middle age professionals. So 25 to 34 are the ages on this. Um, it's uh, let me see. I want to see where it ranks real quick. Uh, LinkedIn is not listed. I don't know. Doesn't have it. Interesting. <laughs> oh, Pinterest. Pinterest. I don't know how many people have a Pinterest board. I've never had one. Believe it or not. Did you use Pinterest? I've had Pinterest since I was 11 years old when the app awesome. first came out. Awesome. Yeah. So Pinterest, again, this is another one of those very visually driven social media. Uh, a little bit more difficult, I feel, to advertise, particularly on Pinterest. Uh, but they do have 478 million users. So the idea of Pinterest are like online bulletin boards. So people are going through and, and gathering the things that are, uh, you know, appealing and, and visually attractive and recipe, all these different things that are pinning into these boards and keeping them digitally for future reference. So, you know, it's it's definitely has a, a pretty wide age demographic, 36 to 64. Um, but uh, it looks like, uh, just reading, yep, it's up there. The demographics for Generation Z and Millennials is up a little bit. So people are starting to, to, to come around to it. Uh, a lot of link backs to Pinterest, which makes it nice. Again, it's for that algorithm, uh, getting people involved. Uh, Pinterest is the 14th. I don't even know there's that many, but 14th. Most social media platform. 
Uh, Twitter. So Twitter has its ups and downs, right? I think Twitter, when it first came out, was super hot. People loved it, and then everybody hated it, and now everybody's kind of loving it again. Uh, but it is one of those uh, social media platforms that gets pretty used pretty regularly. Uh, last uh, report, 211 million daily active users. 83% uh, of all the world's leaders are on Twitter, believe it or not. That's insane to me. 83% of the world's leaders. 42% uh, of all Twitter users have graduated college. Uh, so this tends to be kind of that gap between Facebook and LinkedIn. A lot of, uh, again, important people, political people, people who make decisions are on Twitter. Uh, I think it's an interesting statistic. 17% of Americans get their news from Twitter. Um, we don't have a lot of clients that use Twitter locally. Uh, we haven't done too many campaigns, but it's definitely something when you go out, it's all, again, tricking the algorithm. It's the people you follow and the people you tweet to. Uh, 500 million tweets sent daily. Daily. So it's pretty active social media now. TikTok. Everybody loves TikTok, especially for 16 to 24. <laughs> TikTok, uh, I mean, we saw it. We see it in the news. We've, we've followed along. TikTok became huge during the pandemic. People uh, locked indoors, wanting to be entertained, entertain other people. So TikTok. Uh, seventh most used social media platform. At the end of September 2021, it passed 1 billion monthly subscribers. So there's 1 billion monthly subscribers apps been downloaded over two billion times now this this is definitely a very uh niche demographic uh, a lot of people that are doing advertising on twitter are trying to reach younger generations uh i don't know if people have actually if, you, if you're not familiar with TikTok, but it is video shorts uh so it is very driven by video again video is what's driving content right now uh, a great tool for you know trying to reach those younger audiences to be able to condense a message real quick, a nice, easy, digestible bite. And uh, again, you have the ability to follow people who have the ability to follow you. Uh, so you do have that social interaction to be able to build a following. What really sets TikTok apart is that they're kind of known right now for being the king of the algorithm. TikTok has an algorithm that is unlike any other social platform, and they have it under lock and key. They are not giving it up. Um, everyone is rushing to try to mimic them, and that's because TikTok has gotten really, really, really good at compiling your information, even so much as if you hesitate on certain things versus if you scroll past it immediately, it gathers all that information and custom creates a for you page, um, which is just what they think you want to see. Um, and it's all it's not only based off of you, but based off of contacts in your phone, other people that are using the app that you know. Um, and so it's really this hyper hyper specific and hyper niche platform that pushes people essentially only the type of things they want to see and nothing they don't. And that brings us to YouTube. YouTube is the second most visited website in the entire world. So 51% of their audience visits the site daily. Uh, we have a few clients that take advantage of YouTube, a great place to house you know, videos about work, videos. Uh, we have a few clients that use it as a daily video blog. Again, people love to digest video content and short bites. Uh, so you can really have a lot of fun and create a YouTube channel. Uh, the other nice thing is it's kind of a repository for those videos. So you can actually put all these videos on Facebook and link to, or on YouTube and link them to your Facebook, link them to your Instagram. Uh, so again, it goes all into you know feeding that algorithm, getting your name out there. Uh, there's a lot of time you need to invest in having a really good YouTube channel. Um, but I mean, again, the average visitor to YouTube checks out uh, 8.89 pages per day. So. Second most used social media platform that we have. So we've been talking about this, uh, I know we're getting short on time, but we've been talking about this idea of an algorithm. Uh, you've probably heard that word more than a billion times because people love and hate algorithms. Um, but here's a few things to consider. So as we're talking about this idea of marketing, build your brand, get on social media, you know, having a good online presence, um, this is all, the whole trick, everything that's involved in this whole new digital forefront 
that we never had to deal with with physical advertising is an algorithm. So this algorithm is a mathematical equation that just runs the internet and determines what it feeds different people. So we always encourage people to have an active Facebook. You know, if you have the ability to write a blog on your website, um, if you have the ability to make sure all your Google information is up to date, all these different factors, the frequency people interact with you on your Facebook page, the frequency people interact with you on your websites, uh, the content that you post all gets fed into this. And the more that you have out there digitally, the more the algorithm can pick it up and the more that's going to serve it to the clients and the targets you're trying to find. So these are just some of the really core, really quick hit uh, tips on how to use the algorithm to your advantage. So again, interacting, encouraging comments from your audience, uh, tagging other people. You know, you, you, you buy those shoes or you're trying to sell those shoes and you, you encourage people to post a picture and tag you guys. You know, tagging other businesses you're interested in, following other businesses. Uh, hashtags. There was a moment there when hashtags started to die out, now they're back. Hashtags is just a really easy way for people to sort through content. So when we post things on uh, Instagram, we use you know, hashtag graphic design. So anybody that's following anything about graphic design is going to get fed that post because of the hashtag. Uh, you want to optimize your post timing to encourage engagement. So what that means is, you know, when I post something on Facebook at 10 a.m., it doesn't get a response when I post it at 6 p.m. So be able to have that trial and error. When am I posting things? When is my audience online? These are things you want to know. Uh, that's another thing that will help you figure out your publishing frequency. Uh, usually with a new brand, when we take it on, uh, for the first three months, we try to recommend people post at least three times a week. So having content out and being able to post regularly. Um, you know, publishing videos across all of it. That goes back to, you know, putting on YouTube, linking up to Facebook. You know, and I love this, when in doubt, experiment with different types of content. So, you know, maybe videos work great for you or maybe still photography. Finding out what your audience responds to is a very big part of that. Okay, Jared, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Just let yep. you know that we have um, about three minutes left. Oh gosh, um, well, we only have two slides. So we're okay, perfect. Slides, right? <laughs> So to say all that, to get back to this, content is king. So, you know, whatever content you're pushing out there, that's what's important. Be able to keep that uh, aligned with what you're trying to say and getting as much out as possible. Just ask any cat on the internet. Uh, all this reinforces, I know I'm flying, reinforces this top of mind awareness. The more that you're in the people's faces, the more your message is out there, the more people are talking about you, the more it's going to be in the back of their mind. So when they need that product, they want to give that donation. All that work is what that what you're trying to accomplish. And it doesn't happen overnight. Good branding campaigns take, you know, six months to a year to really saturate. So don't get frustrated if you don't see that response right off the bat. It, it is. It's a long game. Building a brand and building a message takes time. And the key to all that is being consistent. So whatever you do, make sure you have consistent colors, consistent fonts, consistent messaging. You want somebody to see things and know that it's you. And... To sum it all up, you know, it's a lot to think about, a lot to process. Uh, if you don't want to do it, we definitely can help you out with it. This is our contact information. We would love to interact or help anybody out that we can, so feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, give us a call or check out our website. We're happy to help. And also, um, Metropolis will be in one of the, um, the booths in the expo section. So you will want to go there. They will be there to answer any questions one-on-one -on -one and engage in conversation. Um, that booth opens at um, 3.05. So um, that will run for about uh, 20 minutes. If anybody has any questions specifically for Jared or Israelia with Metropolis, um, you would want to reach out to them there. Or, of course, email them or call them. Um, at their office so that you can um, get acquainted with them and talk a little bit more in depth about your particular marketing strategy. Um, they do fabulous things for the chamber. Um, he mentioned the um, relocation guide and we have plenty of those available. So if anyone is interested in that, just reach out to me, um, wbennett at chillicotheohio.com. Um, and we can shoot one out to you so that you can see exactly what kind of project they put together for us and possibly um, have them work on a project very similar for you. 
All right. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Israelia. Thank you, Metropolis Design Studios. And um, really a lot of good stuff to think about. So we appreciate it. And everyone, thank you for joining us for today's session and have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay.